It's the week of July 23rd, 2018, and you're listening to the Missouri Growing Point Agronomy podcast. I'm your co-host, Pioneer Field Agronomist Jamie Farmer, and with me as always is my counterpart to the east, Nick Monning. This week we talk about growth stage and GDU accumulation as well as high nighttime temp effects on corn and silage as well. So Nick, with a lot of the area continuing to see the effects of a hot dry summer, uh, we're progressing pretty quickly here throughout the uh, growth stages in our corn crop. A lot of this stuff in that R4 stage, even some of that early planted stuff getting a little bit of some denting kernels starting to show up. So just kind of give us an idea here, just based on GDU accumulation, where would a majority of our crop here in central Missouri be sitting in today? And what do we look like going forward? Yeah, Jamie, um, if I look at how we are right now, so if I just pull an example, April 17th planted 111 day maturity. We're about 381 heat units GDUs above normal. So that is uh, way ahead of normal and that would project us to black layer around the August 10th to 15th if temperatures hold. So if we black layer then, that means grain moisture is around 30 to 35% moisture at black layer, which means we are in and ready for an early harvest. So when we think about temperatures and how we're speeding along with GDUs right now, really crunching along. So drought obviously is the major yield limiting factor right now, but we're also seeing a lot of high temperatures as well, really pushing the GDUs along. So, so far our nighttime temperatures have been running above normal. So not just to mention the heat during the day, but also our nighttime temperatures running higher than normal. So Jamie, is that a bad thing or not? Yeah, it's probably not going to be a good thing on this corn crop. Uh, you think about those high nighttime temperatures are known to reduce corn yields in two different ways. So the first being that they increase the rate of respiration in the corn plant. Um, some folks would mention that uh, basically that corn crop's got to keep the AC on at night, which requires more sugar for energy, thus making less sugar available for kernel development. Um, one of the other ways that that also, those high nighttime temperatures also reduce yield is it accelerates the development of the corn plant so it matures much sooner and and like you've mentioned you know with us being 380 gdus ahead of schedule um, you can really start to see a lot of that corn progressing through the growth stage really quickly so if you listen to the experts you know talking about high nighttime temperatures a lot of them will mention that if you string together five or more nights above 70 degrees at night which we've had quite a bit of here you really start to cut into that yield so we've easily been doing that lately and so that's that's something else you know like you mentioned drought probably the number one concern for a lot of folks and the lack of moisture but high nighttime temperatures haven't been helping us out very well either so one of the other things we just mentioned here with drought affecting a lot of our corn crop we've already seen several folks out there already starting to chop corn silage Uh, So, Nick, you know, when would we typically decide to chop corn silage here in Missouri? Yeah, Jamie, that's a that's a good question. And for a lot of our geography, what we typically look for with corn silage is a lot of guys start chopping around 50 percent milk line. So if you are wanting to figure out what the milk line looks like, that's after we get into that that denting stage, you can break that ear in half. You look at the top side of the ear when you flip it over, you'll be able to see that milk line starting to regress back. When we hit about halfway on that milk line, that's usually when most folks start getting started chopping. Uh, we should be very close to this. If I'd use my example, that 111 day planted April 17th, Central Missouri, we're probably going to be real close to that here by the end of the month, maybe even just a shade before or shade after, but we're going to be real close to that. The problem is, is in some of the areas where we're hearing some of it starting to get chopped already, we may not have an ear on there to look at to gauge off of. So in those cases, what we're looking for is probably 60 to 70% moisture, whole plant moisture, depending on what kind of silo structure you're gonna use. 60 to 70% moisture, keep in mind that sometimes those plants that are drought stressed actually are holding more moisture than we think they are. So not a bad idea if you got a way to test the moisture, be sure to test it and see if it's running that 60 to 70% range. Yeah, good point, Nick. One way to uh, to test that is if you can get somebody to let you use uh, the microwave in your house. The University of Nebraska Lincoln has a link on their website that shows you how to do a microwave oven test uh, for moisture content in forage. Um, but again, like Nick mentioned, there we're, we're typically trying to look in that sixty to seventy percent moisture range. You know, something else uh, with a lot of folks that are maybe. 
going to utilize silage this winter with the limited forages out there in the pastures and the hay shortage that Missouri is already starting to see the effects of. You know, one thing we want to make sure to mention is is whether or not there are any nitrates concerns with that nick. So what should some of the some of the growers out there be looking for when it comes to nitrates? Yeah, Jamie, with things like drought that happened to us on a corn crop, we can see some pretty high nitrate levels. You can also see high nitrate levels under some pretty cloudy conditions. And obviously stuff that's going to get chopped where we just got rain there yesterday, probably going to see some pretty high nitrate levels in that stuff as well. Definitely something to be concerned about. Um, you can have it tested if you want to before you you get started cutting. The extension office can run a test for you. But if properly ensiled, the nitrate levels will get cut in half by the ensiling process. So nitrate's probably not as big a concern with silage. Um, obviously a major concern with hay or with stuff that we're going to try to put up and bale dry. But would highly encourage everyone to ensile in some way whether it's wrapping, whether it's bagging, whether it's piling on the ground or in a bunker, definitely try to ensile that corn silage in some way or another because that will cut your nitrate load in half and probably get rid of your concerns in terms of nitrates. Yeah, that's a good point. So the biggest concern for us probably is that stuff that's going to get dried and baled or anybody that's going to go out there and graze some of those stocks. So uh, one of the other ways to to possibly kind of limit the amount of nitrates that could show up in there as well would be to increase that cutting height too. So like Nick mentioned there, you get accumulation of those nitrates in the stock, the lower stock's going to have a bit of a bigger load in there. Something else that a lot of guys have been asking about that maybe haven't necessarily chopped silage here uh, for a while is, is how much does an inoculant help? So one of the points on that is, you know, it's not necessarily going to reduce the nitrates in the silage. However, it will enhance fermentation, which is going to save you a lot of those sugars and prevent heating at feeding out. So for us, for Pioneer, we highly recommend using 11C33 inoculant on this corn silage. Most of our cattle producers can't really afford to lose any more feed value with the limited forages and the limited feed that we have out there in the state of Missouri as it is. So something that some of these other folks are asking too is, can I pile the silage on top of the ground, Nick? So what are some of the advice that we have there for those folks? Yeah, first, number one, you can pile it on top of the ground. One thing you need to watch is just make sure you do it in a place that's got some pretty good drainage or be sure that you make it in a way that it drains before you get started. Just that mixing of the silage and the soil on the bottom, obviously you're going to lose some of that. There's some pretty nasty organisms in the soil when it comes to feeding. So just try to make sure that stuff drains off so we get less mixing there. The other thing to note or to be aware of is that the experts say you need to maintain a three to one slope on that stuff. And so that means for every one foot you go high, you need to go three foot off both sides. So that really means if you have a 10 foot tall pile, it needs to have a 60 foot wide footprint, which I know sounds really wide and that's a lot wider than most people typically do it here in Missouri. We normally have really narrow, tall piles, but if you're piling on the ground, the reason why is because that allows you to drive over that pile in every direction. And really, when it comes to ensiling, the more you can pack that stuff, the greater you pack it, you push all the air out, you will get a better ensiling process and a better product at the end. So definitely try to, if you can, if you're just piling on top of the ground, try to maintain that three to one. Yeah, one of the other things that you can use is some kind of oxygen barrier film to cover drive over piles as well. Um, Folks that do a poor job of covering those silage bunkers and piles uh, can can have a significant impact when it comes to shrink loss. Um, So that's something else you want to make sure that you're doing a good job of. One of the other questions, I guess, Nick, is for some of these folks that are already out of a forage, and especially these, these folks that have some hungry cattle out there, how quickly can we feed this uh, silage crop yeah jamie so first thing i guess i'd recommend is is be sure let's pull a test on that silage before we start feeding it just so we know what the value the nutrient value of that is and just so we can look at the nitrate levels but if we're doing a pretty quick turnaround that's probably a good idea but i will say that if it's improperly ensiled it probably two weeks is all the longer that that process takes and we can start feeding it. But then if we use an inoculant, something like 11C33, that probably cuts that process down to three to four days. So it's actually a pretty quick 
timetable, a pretty quick turnaround, but I'd strongly encourage you if you're going to have to tear into it that quickly that you probably have a test run on it. You know, a lot of uh, key questions there when it comes to silage and chopping some of this drought stricken corn or uh, for some of these producers out there that are just trying to find another feed source for the cattle this winter. So I guess the main take home points just to summarize here for us, chopping is going to be early. We try to target 60 to 70 percent whole plant moisture. A lot of folks utilize the ear as a gauge for that, uh, but in some places that's not necessarily going to be available uh, where we're severely drought stricken. Nitrates are a concern in the drought areas particularly after you get things like rainfall or cloudy days. So making sure that uh, you're testing that feed, you're testing those those stocks to see where you sit on a nitrate level. We would highly recommend using an inoculant. 11C33 is probably the best one in our lineup to be able to try to maintain as much of that feed value as possible. And then for those of you that are going to use makeshift silos, uh, that three to one rule that Nick talked about there. So with that in mind, you know, just a couple of future things here to maybe keep an eye on here in the coming weeks. You know, we didn't talk much about soybeans, Nick. Is there anything out there that you're seeing? I know I'm seeing a few things with some pests and some disease. Um, what would you recommend to look out for out there? Yeah, Jamie, that's a good point. I've seen a lot of trash stricken soybeans over the last couple of days. We are seeing, or the last couple of weeks. So we are seeing some leaves start to drop off just due to the drought stress. So keep keep that in mind. Sometimes people think, it's some major disease or something. But the other thing to be aware of, been seeing some frog eye over the last couple of weeks starting to move in. Areas that have had humidity, have hit, had heat, we're starting to see it. So keep your eye out for it if you've not sprayed a fungicide. The other thing would be spider mites. So they've kind of been a problem in areas all summer long, earlier than normal, and probably going to continue to be a problem throughout August as we push into August. So I would be aware of of those two things, especially. Excellent point. And with that, that's all the time we're going to take from you today. We appreciate you tuning in. We want to thank you for your time and thank you for your business. Nick, it's always important. If folks can't find us in the field, where can they find us? Yeah, you can find the podcast at podcast.pioneer.com. Or you can look me up on Twitter at Nick Monning. And I'm at the Jamie Farmer. And again, you can also always reach out to your Pioneer sales professional and get signed up for those Walking Your Fields newsletters and other timely agronomic info delivered to your inbox. Uh, They're also a good source of information when it comes to any sort of silage or inoculant questions as well. So with that, again, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your time and thank you for your business. We look forward to seeing you again.